Fascinating, fascinating. I'm going to start just asking a couple of the questions that have come through from okay. people in the audience. Um, okay. One of them is, what are the top three laws that you practice in your daily life? I assume they're talking about the laws of power. I mean, the, the number one law is um, learn to keep people dependent on you. And people misunderstand that law. They think it's like really ugly and it's not at all. What I mean by that is, it all goes back to what we're talking about, your uniqueness. If people can replace you in this world, they will replace you. Mm -hmm. If you have a job and you're 30 years old and you're making a certain income and you have a skill set, they could replace with somebody who's 24 who will make half your salary. They will get rid of you tomorrow. There's no loyalty in this world at all, right? But if you have a skill that nobody else has, if you have a skill set to get rid of you is going to cause them pain, they are dependent on you in some way, then they will not fire you. You have secured your position. And for me personally, writing the books that I do, I try and make it that nobody else can write a book like I write. It may be terrible. It may not, you may hate it, but I'm unique. I'm one of a kind. I can't be replaced by some other writer at Penguin, you know? They can't cover it the way I do. So kind of mining your uniqueness and doing something that's irreplaceable mm. is sort of a, an incredible source of power. The only other one I would say is assume formlessness, law number 48. I love that law, it's kind of where I decided to end it. And I like to never have too solid a form. Mm. So I was better at this in the past, but people don't know exactly where I'm coming from. They don't know exactly who I am. They don't know, they have no idea what I'm going to write next as well. And I find that kind of formlessness fits very well with my sort of fluid personality for better or worse. So those would be the two laws that I practice. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into a third, but I, I no, can't no, think of one right away. That's totally fine. I remember you writing somewhere once that basically speak as little as possible. And that's yeah. in cons keeping with this formlessness. So nobody could quite get a grip on who you are. Right, right. And here I'm violating that very law, talk, <laughs> exactly. talking so much. Right. I have, a, I see there are a number of questions that are all about toxic people. Um, oh. What are the best ways to get rid of them? Another is, what are the red flags? Like, how do you deal? And it, it's an interesting question when, especially we live in a society where I think the official surveys show that something like 50% of all chief executives are technically psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I haven't read that high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it could um, even be higher for all I know. Yeah, well, maybe. it could be. So so how do you how do you clock it and how do you deal with it? Well, the best way of dealing it with it is to recognize it before you get involved with it. So if you're an employer and you're looking to hire people. The worst thing, or you're looking for a partner in your business, the worst thing is to, to mis make the mistake and inadvertently hire someone like that. And then they're messing with your life. It's really difficult to get rid of them. They kind of embroil you in all kinds of emotional traumas. And then you start wondering about yourself, et cetera. So the best defense here is to recognize them before they get involved in your life. And I say people always leave a trail, right? there's always signs of something that is not quite right with them beforehand. You're just not paying attention, mm. okay? So first of all, everybody has a past now. The past is very visible, transparent on the internet. Look at their past, look at their patterns, kind of, you know, do any kind of information you can dig up on them. Look at their social media posts, you know, et cetera, and get a sense of their character, all right? The second thing is, when you're involved with them person to person, people give off signals. And I tell toxic people have learned, and we're talking about narcissists, a lot of this is, you know, a lot of those CEOs are raging narcissists like an Elon Musk, et cetera. A lot of these people learn very early on to hide it. And how do you hide it? You appear to be charming. You appear to be very charismatic. You even appear to be somewhat interested in other people, right? But I tell people, the face doesn't lie, body language doesn't lie, the tone of voice doesn't lie. Pay attention. So I've had this thing with narcissists, look at their eyes. The eyes are often kind of dead. 
They mm -hmm. seem to be talking about you and they're interested in you, but they're not really paying attention to you. They're not really absorbing themselves in your world. Pay attention to their body language, pay attention to their past patterns and get the hell away from them. Do not hire them. Do not have a personal, an intimate relationship with them. Do not hire them as partners, et cetera. That's the best strategy of all. Once you're with them and it's, you know, you're, you're the personal assistant to an Elon Musk, then it's a whole other situation. Your livelihood depends on it. You can't get rid of them, right? Mm -hmm. The main thing to do is to develop a degree of an emotional detachment because toxic people, they thrive, they work by getting you, by hitting and triggering your emotions. They're masters at playing on, playing you on this. If they're the ones making you emotional while they are cold inside, they continually have the strategic advantage. They can push your buttons whenever they want to. They can make you go home thinking about them. And while you're thinking about them, you're not doing what you need to be doing. You're not you know, able to work against them, et cetera. You need to understand that that's how they operate. And you have to take baby steps, in developing some degree of detachment. You first tell yourself, it's not about me. The, the, the games they're playing, it's not about me personally. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's who they are. They're, they're, this is their nature. This is the animal that they are. So it's not about me personally. It's about their parents. It's about their childhood. It's about their own past. They're dealing with demons. So don't take things personally. And then begin to, to see them some distance, even to see them. I remember like um, there's a story of Shostakovich, the great Russian composer who had to deal with Joseph Stalin. He's like the number one psychotic boss in the history of the planet, right? Uh, he's a fascinating subject. Shostakovich had to deal with him, and he, he developed this kind of detachment. But what he also did was he saw Stalin as this kind of helpless little child. He, infant, he infantilized him. He said, this is not this powerful, glowering man who, can, who has power over life and death. This is this little puny, little whiny child who had a terrible childhood, who was really helpless and insecure. And that helped him not get all excited in his presence and kind of become intimidated. So there you go. That's sort of how I answer it. <laughs> super, super interesting. Uh, we've got a question. Um, someone is going for a job interview, it looks like. I bet a lot of people in the audience are. And they ask, can you give some tips on using power and seduction in the course of those job interviews? And second, would you talk about your favorite writer and who are you reading at the moment or what reading do you recommend at the moment? Okay. So the first question about a job interview, well, I don't know if you want to really be practicing seduction so much, or if you are, you want to kind of tone that down a little bit. But the main thing is to do your research. That is the number one key here. So you don't go in there thinking about your brilliant ideas, this is my great experience. This is how I'm going to change the company. You do research on the first on the person that you're interviewing with. You know, you find out what they what they're like, what their you know character is like. You get a sense of what they're missing, why, what the job is, you know, what they need from the person they're hiring. You also do research on the company and where it's headed. And you and so when you're in that interview, I always tell people. The key to having confidence is preparation, right? So in, on film sets, Alfred Hitchcock, the great film director, you know, there's nothing more stressful than directing a film. He'd be sitting in his director's chair and he'd be falling asleep in the middle of a scene. We go, how does he do that? He was so prepared. He had prepared every single aspect of film production. He didn't worry about anything, right? So if you're prepared, if you've done research about the guy or woman who's interviewing you or the company, and you've scoped it out. And then from that, you develop a little bit about how you're going to approach it. You will suddenly enter that interview in a lot better state, you know, because what you want to do is you want to feel appeal to their self-interest, what they need. Mm. The thing I tell people is the number one need of most powerful people is time, saving them time, because everyone is working way too hard, is overwhelmed. So you're going to figure out what you can do to offer them to organize their life better and save them time. I mean, that, all jobs are different, but if that's the particular scenario. Then what was the second part? Oh, what you're am I reading? reading. Yeah. Um, well, I'm doing research for the Sublime book, and 
I always read ahead to the next chapter. So I'm writing now, right, uh, right now about childhood and the childhood sublime. And the main figure in that is Vladimir Nabokov, the great Russian novelist, because he wrote an amazing autobiography about his childhood. But I'm sort of preparing the next chapter, which is about the neuro sublime, about the sublimity of the human brain. And I'm kind of searching for stories. So I'm reading a, a, a massive um, biography of William James, the great psychologist. It's very interesting, but I don't think he's quite right. Then I'm segueing to a biography on my desk that's sitting here in French about the great uh, novelist, Philip K. Dick, the man who wrote science fiction, because he had some very strange things with his, the wiring of his brain. And then I have Oliver Sacks, you know, the great neuros. So those three books that I'm kind of poking at right now for research for my next book. So, so interesting. Um, yeah. You know, it's fascinating also, uh, when you talk to people about how have they changed how they work for different bosses and they're like, wait, no, I do the same thing for each one of my bosses every time. But some people like to get their information for an auditory way. Some people are visual, some people are kinesthetic. So this capacity to understand what is the way the person you're dealing with wants to receive what you're giving them. And most people don't even think about that, but that's back to your empathy point, like really know not only who you're talking to, but how they want to receive what you're saying. Right, right. It'd be interesting to be able to have that kind of information with it. What are, what are they like as an animal? Are they visually oriented, et cetera? I don't know how you do that, though, in your research. That's something more you're going to discover in person-to-person -person encounter. But yeah, yeah. reading body language and, and becoming attuned to nonverbal communication is an extremely important skill to develop. And it's I go into, I have a whole chapter on that in the laws of human nature. Amazing. Well, that leads to a question here about your experience as a screenwriter, which is, ah. I think, very much an auditory kind of a skill, listening for dialogue and how people speak. And the question was, um, how did your experience as a screenwriter help you understand power and influence and the importance of story? Well, it did, it did um, have a lot to do with my interest in story and, and how to entertain people. So all of my books, every chapter begins with a story. The Daily Laws, we kind of took that out, but I'm always into seducing the reader into following me and my ideas with a story first and to make it entertaining. I'm always thinking of the entertainment value of it and how I can take the reader inside the story not be looking at it from a kind of an intellectual point of view but kind of feeling it and you know that's that's definitely part of screenwriting i must say i wasn't very good at it this was one of my sort of failed careers i was very good at writing dialogue my specialty was comedy believe it or not i loved writing comedy and parodies and i think i was good at it but i'm not so into the uh, I, i'm not somebody who likes like heavy violence or really explicit sex scenes or anything. So I'm sort of like out of touch with the times. I was, people would read my screenplays and they go, Robert, that's really, it's kind of literary, your screenplay. Maybe you would be good for theater, which was a sort of way of insulting me and saying, I don't think you've got, you're cut out for the Hollywood industry. But the main thing Hollywood taught me was about power, was about, you know, a writer has no power in Hollywood. It's like the weakest position on a chessboard. You're like a pawn because, because it's the other people who have all the power. So the first thing they do when they bring in a writer, when you look at on the credits of any film, you'll see written by Stephen this and Rachel that and John this. And there'll be like eight names written there. That's because they constantly bring in, they have their notes. They tell you what they want. Oh, we'll bring in this person to write the female parts. We'll bring in this person. You have no power. And then what ends up coming out is kind of like a sausage because it, you know, it's it's not like the original pork or anything. It's just been put through this grinding machine and out comes the screenplay. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who likes power, I'm, as you obviously know. I don't want to write something where 12 people come on, the producer, the other writers, the director, the actors are all kind of putting their two cents in. I hated that. Mm -hmm. I want, and I think it's what really hurts movies in the long run. You get somebody with a solid voice who knows how to write, who's, who's you know, got a keen observation of human nature. Just let them write the damn screenplay. 
give them the notes, but give one person control, you know? So, um, I mean, that was the main lesson that I had in Hollywood was about power and how to take back power for myself by writing books. <laughs> I have one last question because we're sure. coming up now on 830. There's someone in the audience who, who's a young person who's disabled. And he writes, uh, I'm a young disabled man. Your books have helped me so much. What advice would you give your younger self if you had your stroke as a young man? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that would be very difficult, but, um, it's basically, you know, it's, there's a, something that happened for a reason, because I don't know what your disability is. And that's, that would be sort of a cruel thing to say, but there is something that, that makes you different because of that, right? It makes you have a different sensibility. And so some of the things I'm writing about in my new book, I'm looking at people who were born deaf or blind or were colorblind, et cetera, and how they compensated for that. There's a great psychologist, Alfred Adler, uh, who's a disciple of Freud, who talked about how when children or young people have some kind of disability, they learn how to compensate for it. And that's what leads to some great scientists and great mathematicians, right? So there's some kind of power inside whatever your disability is. It gives you a unique perspective on your world and on the people around you, right? Because some of the greatest pieces of literature or artwork and culture are, are come from people who are outsiders, who see the world differently. They're not embedded in the culture. They can see the forest for the trees. So you have a slightly bit of an outsider perspective. You're looking at the world from a different angle than other people are who don't have your particular disability. You want to lean into that. You don't want to end up kind of trying to deny it and be more like other people. You want to see psychologically, mentally, where that leaves you in a different place than other people. And there's power in that. There's power in your unique psychology and how you look at the world and how you're wired differently and how you see things, how you see things from a different perspective. I mean, I could say for sure that if you were a writer, that would be the source of your power. I don't know what in, in, in you know, if you're an entrepreneur, there'll be ways you can look at businesses that can be geared towards, towards people with disabilities. I wish there was an industry out there for stroke victims. You have no idea the chaos out there. There's no therapy that's coordinated. People have no clue what to do about a stroke. They come from 12 different angles, right? So, you know, I don't know what field you're in, but think of it as potentially a strength that gives you a way of looking at the world that is different and sets you apart and could be the source of something very powerful, either a business, a book, or a higher level of empathy as I developed for other people who, who don't have much power in this world, who feel sort of helpless. So that's what I would say. It reminds me of that book, I bet you've read it, Colin Wilson's The Outsiders. Where he yeah, I love Colin Wilson. He, he a, little known, a little known writer in this world, and he was magnificent. I th I, I, we need a revival of Colin Wilson. I have so many of his books. Uh, yeah, me Super too. Consciousness, Rasputin, amazing writer. Totally. By the way, I just had to say, amazingly, my parents were living in Nabokov's house when I was born. I was literally in, born into Nabokov's well, house. In, in, New, New, in New England? And when in he New was York? when he was teaching at Cornell, and my dad was teaching at Cornell, so there's oh, a wow. Nabokov connection we have. <laughs> wow, was it, were there any signs of him still? Were there like dead butterflies nailed yeah. to the wall or <laughs> <laughs> not that I've heard? <laughs> uh -huh. I'll ask my dad. But listen, this has been magnificent, and thank oh. you so much for the time, and thank you for taking the time to write these amazing books. Oh, well, you, thank you, you very much fans everywhere so thank you very much for my pleasure i enjoyed it and i have to get a copy of your book but we'll talk about that later all right so lovely to all meet right. you all right very thank nice you to meet very you much. all right thank you very much